Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and co-parents of all ages, this podcast is for you. Introducing in the center ring the amicable divorce expert, Judith Weigel. Divorce is a financial lawsuit, and money is the A number one reason why people get divorced. Sexual adultery, interestingly enough, is the second reason. I had no idea what financial infidelity was, nor financial therapy, until I met our two guests, doctors Megan McCoy and Alex Melchumian, both highly credentialed in marriage and family therapy, but with a specialty in money and how it impacts personal relationships. Megan is at Kansas State University, um, licensed marriage and family therapist, but she is also an adjunct faculty member at the university where she teaches courses for financial therapy, for the financial therapy certification program. And we'll learn more from Megan as she speaks. Dr. Alex Melchumian is also a licensed marriage and family therapist, and he's founder of the Financial Psychology Center in Los Angeles, California. Um, his his uh, schooling is devoted to financial and mental health by uncovering patterns in relationships with money, why we're stuck and why we're suffering. And I may, by the way, offer myself as a guinea pig here. I could be your perfect client, Megan and Alex. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having us. Glad to be here. Thank you, Judith. Pleasure uh, to be on. Listen, my pleasure too. When I heard you speak at the monthly meeting of the Los Angeles Marriage and Family Therapist, you blew me away. And I was so excited when you agreed to come on the program. So I would like you both for a minute to share with our audience how you became interested in how money is a part of a relationship in ways that either supports or destroys the relationship. You know, was it how we grew up with money? How did it become a part of our relationships? Um, Did you see this in your clients? Could you just give us a little background, each of you, on where you come from with this topic? Uh, Well, I was so lucky because what happened to me is I was a therapist and I wanted to be a better therapist. So I went back to school for a doctorate. And it turns out doctorates don't teach you how to do therapy. They teach you how to do statistics or theory or things like that. And so I'm like kind of floundering around in my doctorate program and the Financial Therapy Association's annual conference came to town and I accidentally stumbled in there and saw a live demonstration of financial therapy. And I was like, oh my gosh, my clients need this and I need this. And so 10 years ago, if you had told me I'd be talking about money to anybody, I would have told you I was, you're crazy. This is not something I do. And now that's all I want to do is help people have a better relationship with money. Um, So that's why I love financial therapy. (laughs) Alex, before you answer, I just have to ask Megan a quick question. Honestly, Megan, financial um, your your relationship to money actually uh, uh, had an impact on you and how you dealt um, with money personally? Yeah, I actually published an article at, in the Journal of Financial Therapy, if anybody's up for nerdy reading, about how much improving my financial knowledge and health and well-being improved not only my wallet, but also improved my relationship with my husband, helped me dream about goals differently, decreased stress in all these areas of my life, and made me a better therapist. And so I'm so thankful for stumbling into financial therapy. (laughs) Okay, so that's very comforting to hear. Thank you so much from the professional. Alex, how about you? Uh, Thank you so much, Megan. And I can definitely piggyback as a a quote-unquote bleeding heart, uh, a person who is an empath and wants to help as many people as possible. I can definitely relate to your story. Um, I was a sort of a garden variety marriage and family therapist in Los Angeles um, in the mid 2000s, really sort of at the cusp of the Great Recession. And what happened for me, just like Megan described, I had a blind spot around my own uh, money story. I didn't really kind of put anything together between financial stress and how it impacts my clients 
or our relationships overall. And all of a sudden, I started to hear individual clients, as well as couples that I was seeing at the time on my proverbial couch, really discuss a lot of financial stress. Um, you know, financial trauma is what we know it to be now. Uh, you know, clients losing their homes, losing a third of their investment portfolios, and really just kind of dire situations like that, that really opened my eyes to the idea that this is a, a big need. And uh, the second part of that was, you know, when I looked up and started to look around for some help and <laughs> assistance from fellow psychologists, you know, and helping professionals, there were really wasn't a lot out there, probably actually nothing, kind of crickets. And so as they say, you know, if, if, uh, if, if it doesn't exist, then, <laughs> then it's up to me and, you know, us like uh, Dr. Megan and I to really build it. And that's really how I, you know, I kind of really got enthralled in the topic of financial psychology and financial therapy. And then the last thing, actually, I'll, I'll add, and I, I mentioned this to you uh, before, is the fact that uh, I started to delve into my own money story as a result of that. And um, I had the perfect blind spot because I was born and raised in the Soviet Union in, in Russia in a culture that did not value money. And so I really, my, my cultural background came, uh, was basically informing me not to uh, pay attention to anything financial. And so when, when that narrative started to play out, I really saw how much, you know, our, our, our bringing, our culture, our, our parents and our intergenerational narratives inform our financial behavior and financial psychology. So, Well, that's really where I wanted to go next. So thank you for the segue. I sure. wanted to really start at the beginning of our lives, each individual. When do we as individuals develop our relationship to money, how it's earned, how it's spent, how it's saved, and the relevance that it has in our lives? Megan, why don't you tackle this first and then Alex? Okay. So I love the language that Brad Klontz uses for this. He calls it financial flashpoint. And if you really took a second and reflected on what are your earliest memories around money? What did you see your parents doing around money or how were they interacting with money? All of a sudden you realize at a very young age, we discover money, which is ironic because all of us feel like, when can I talk to my kids about money? Like it's some kind of taboo topic, like, you know, I don't know, porn or sex. And it's not. Taboo. No, you're right. You're absolutely right, Megan. It's a taboo topic. Nobody talked about money in our family. Please go ahead. You're right. Yeah. And so our kids are kind of piecing together their, their observations of our interactions with that, with money at such a young age. And I, I think those financial flashpoints, whether they're good and like remembering the feeling of earning that first dollar or bad, like seeing your parents fight about money or losing money or, or, or just feeling stressed about money, good or bad, they shape us from age two and on, I think. <laughs> How about you, Alex? Well, you're taking me to a, my, a couple of my own flashpoints, one in childhood and the other one that really led me to, again, the love of uh, financial therapy. So after I became a licensed therapist, and all, I actually decided to go back to school and get my doctorate specializing in financial psychology and financial therapy. And one of the things that was so enlightening to me was learning that our relationship with money uh, begins in utero because when pregnant mothers are stressed about money, their cortisol levels, which is a stress hormone, spikes. And so, and thus, the relationship be, uh, with money begin, begins then. And when I heard that, I literally, to this day, I get goosebumps. I don't know if you can see me on camera here. And it, it was just oh, an amazing aha moment can. for me. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, we're on audio only. I can yes. see. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so, you know, the goosebump moment, the aha moment was just kind of earth shattering for me. I don't know if I'm the only one. And so then I, I started to do more research. And of course, I came across Dr. Bratz Klontz's uh, research and work, which is absolutely amazing. And, um, you know, the, the term flashpoint is so powerful. And I think it also, again, speaks to the 
the money taboo because if money as a topic was not taboo, we wouldn't have this feeling of pages getting unstuck or having that flashpoint um, experience. It would just be normal conversation. It would just be a normal memory. Alex, right? wait a minute. I don't mean to interrupt you, but why? Megan brought it up and you brought it up too. Why is it taboo? Because it was in my family too to talk about money with the kids. I think it's taboo for everybody. My colleague and I, Ken White at Georgia, did a study and we found 90% of people in our sample had not talked to anybody about money for an entire year. A loss of opportunity of like sharing ideas or, you know, creating goals together was just gone an entire year of not talking about money. So I think so culturally it's ingrained. I think it's so tied to the idea of recognizing that we have more or having less than those around us. And I mean, money. Jeffrey, ego fulfillment. Wait a minute. Ego fulfillment. Money equals ego fulfillment. And if you don't have a lot of it, you feel less than. Yeah. What do you think? I think that's very true. I mean, Jeffrey Du once said, money is the object that we project our fears, our darkest secrets, our, our desires on. It, it, money isn't something on an Excel file like it should be. Like it should just be a number in a cell in an Excel file. But really it means power, safety, security, and all these other deep primal feelings. So it's hard to talk about. Alex, what about your family? Did anybody talk about money? You did mention Soviet Union. What did you say about money? I forget the phrase. You said it's not, it, it, it's not available. How did you say that? Well, basically that money didn't matter and didn't exist. And right. so as a culture that doesn't um, focus on financial success as a measure of, of success as a measure of human value ability and, and human value other things become takes take money's place so you know our value system just shifts to other other aspects like you know power became much more important uh bargaining and bartering became more important uh in cultures like russia uh, you know crime rate is also <laughs> part of that because hmm. You know, when, when money is no longer the, the currency uh, that we use to, you know, run our daily or, or, or our daily lives, other things uh, have to come in, into place. And the other thing that I mentioned to you before is that it's, it's a source of self-individuation because as a human being, we always want to feel unique. Uh, as a human being, we want to, you know, feel like we are successful. And when that's taken away uh, by, by this, the narrative of money is not important, we're always going to figure out other ways to uh, be successful. And we're never going to be equal to, uh, completely equal to somebody else, right? And as a culture, that was the narrative that I, I grew up in. So. Well, in my family... I will join you in, in self-exposure here. In my family, there were three of us, um, and we were uh, at the most three years apart. Uh, I'm the oldest, two girls and a boy. My dad was very conservative about money, and this was in the 50s, very Aussie and Harriet. He was home at 5.30 for dinner every day. We all sat down for dinner, and it was, it, it was that stereotypical family unit. My mother loved to spend money, although she did not grow up wealthy. Uh, my dad grew up poorer than her, and he was very conservative. And thank God he was, because on his salary, and in those days, $40,000 was a lot of money per year in Pittsburgh, no less. Um, this man was able to send my sister and I to college. We had no loans to take out. Now, granted, it was less back then, but still, proportionately, it was a lot of money. So, the difference between my brother, who is a, a great entrepreneur and very wealthy, and my sister and I, who are very not and must, much more uh, average middle income, he, when my dad told him to wash the car, he didn't go out and wash the car. My dad said, whatever, five, we'll say $5. I'll give you $5 for washing the car. He got the kid across the street to wash the car for $250, and he kept $250. 
I would have never thought about that. So yeah. there's, so we grew up in the same family with the same parents and we're very different about money. Yeah. I'm not a saver. And after I went, saw your program, I said, okay, where am I overspending? Where can I cut back where it won't hurt me? And then I went into self-evaluation. Well, what's the emotion that I feel when I spend money, certainly spend more than I should on things? And what's the the issue I'm having emotionally with saving money? Because my dad did say, at least this, you should, you should save 10% of every dollar that you make. So let's start with, why are we different? Three can, kids different. Yeah. There's, um, you know, Alex already brought out the idea that our culture plays a role, but our gender plays a role too. And there's actually been several researchers, uh, most notably Newcomb and Rabeau, that showed how men and women are socialized by our parents differently. The emphasis is much more on male children to have a job and get a job and make money. And that message is less pushed upon daughters as strongly. And of course, gender dynamics are shifting so much every day, but I think that still might be a pattern of behavior. I also think that some of us are closer to one parent than the others. We notice it. We pay attention to messages more from the parent we are feeling more connected to. And there's also a difference between what they say, like your dad said, save 10%, and what they actually do. And those were in alignment in your view. But if you were raised in a household where maybe they said one thing and did another, some of the siblings may notice more of the behavior and some may notice more of the language just from our processing differences. So that was just a couple of thoughts I had. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. Thanks, Megan. Megan. You know, what I, what I usually say to our clients at Financial Psychology Center is we either do things exactly like our parents or our parents provided such a horrible example that we do pretty much the ac- exactly the opposite, right? So, and that's very true with money as well. Um, you know, some kids end up growing up and, you know, being savers because they're, they're, they either got that message from their parents or they actually just watch their parents and watch their behavior and their parents were savers. So they learned that lesson or it could be the opposite. My parents were such savers that they were just kind of overly prudent. Yeah, everything was, you know, uh, rigid and boring. So I'm going to do the opposite. I want to feel the freedom to spend. And thus, they, they set out in, into life spending, spending away. I think and that, that sort of sets little, up that spending behavior. Well, I think that may have been me, to be honest with you. I think even though I really did have a wonderful upbringing, and I thank God that I had two, two amazing parents who were very different, certainly about money. Um, I think it was when I started earning money, get, it was a get out of jail free card, the money that I made. I also think as an adult, and I'm 68, so, and thank you, I don't look a day over 48. Thank you so much for saying that or thinking that. But <laughs> um, I think that I became insecure with life. And there have been so many, you talk about flashpoints, there have been so many flashpoints in different administrations to my memory, starting with Nixon, and this won't be a political conversation at all, but I'm just saying how I reacted to things. We had recessions in Nixon, uh, Reagan, Bush, Bush Jr., and we haven't had a major recession since. And I've lost money along the way. I actually was saving money and I had good plans, but I think I'm seriously insecure now about how institutions will affect me. Do you have any comment about that? Even though other people are saving and making lots of money and I probably sound crazy. No, no, no. I mean... There has actually been two really large recessions. The housing market in 2008 caused a recession. And then during COVID, we had technically a recession happen. I where forgot that. Years, yeah. Okay. And so yeah. Here, I think even worse than these two large recessions is that COVID has created a sense of um, ambiguity. Like we don't know 
when are things going to be normal? We don't know what life is going to look like next year. And our brains are not set up to deal with ambiguity well. We like something terrible. At least we know what it is and it's concrete rather than something we don't know if it's good or bad. And so I think that sense of powerlessness comes up when we're dealing with a lot of ambiguity. And that could be contributing to that feeling of like, do I have power and control over my financial future? Ahead, I completely agree, uh, Megan. And the fact that it came out of the blue, meaning the the pandemic and the COVID and uh, uh, recession, really kind of I think adds to the feeling of powerlessness and the the ambiguity because we had no idea that it was coming, and then now there's a lot of you know emotional anxiety, fear. And sort of anticip- <laughs> anticipatory anxiety is what we call it in financial psychology, that we don't know. A year ago, nobody would have told us, or you know, a little over a year ago, that we would be in this predicament. So now people are kind of overly cautious, maybe so. And it's going to take a little while for that to thaw out. And a lot of parallels are being drawn in the financial industry to the Great Recession. What kind of narratives came out of the, uh, not the Great Recession, sorry, the Great Depression of the 1930s. What kind of narratives and mindsets came out of that? Um, I had a client who, whose parents were, you know, uh, products of Great Depression. And frugality was just a major byproduct of that, that, you know, kept on being part of the narrative for many, many years. And so we're kind of doing our own research as we go. There, there's definitely, and Dr. Megan can chime in on that, you know, quite a bit more. Uh, we're, you know, the, the jury's still out, so to speak. You know, what will be the overall narrative eventually, 20 years from now? How are we going to look back on this? Um, do you, can you identify the adverse ways in which people use and misuse money, even if they think they're being good at it. What, what are some of those habits? Retail therapy <laughs> is the guest star of that list. Okay, and um, I'm, I'm a participating <laughs> member. Thank you. We're shopping, you know, and actually that narrative really is part of the overall self-care narrative. And without awareness which is another great word or insight, we can rationalize and justify quite a bit of retail therapy under the overall umbrella of, of self-care. How about you? Go ahead, Megan. Well, I just want to pocket on that is that I really believe in moderation and in balance, right? So spending too much and using that as your only self-care uh, mechanism isn't it's not retail therapy that's bad. It's that, is this your go-to every time you hurt? And then that's what the problem is. What other ways do you have of making yourself happy? What other ways do you have to bring joy or to soothe when you're hurting? And again, is spending too much and spending too little that is a misuse of funds. So retail therapy, of course, I want you to spend less and put more in your Roth IRA, but I also don't want you to hoard every money, every dollar, and not do anything that brings you joy in life. And so that balance is the true, I think, path we're trying to go to. You know, after I listened to both of you talk at the um, Los Angeles Marriage and Family Therapist monthly seminar, and I started identifying what I did. Well, okay, truly retail therapy, but honestly, the pandemic knocked that out of me. I loved going out to stores, but business was impaired a bit, so I wasn't eager to spend. I just simply enjoyed being in the environment where you could buy things. Um, but I said, okay, but what do I do that I could uh, pull back on that would make a difference? And, and food, food is one of my issues. So I love going out to eat. I don't cook. Anybody who wants to marry me, uh, I don't cook. So just know that. And, (laughs) um, but I like to order several entrees. That's adventurous to me. It feels comforting. So I said, you know what? One entree. I'm going to go and get a takeout. I felt so accomplished 
walking out with one entree. I can only eat one entree at a time anyway. And I'm a fan of eating bites of things and then putting them away for the, for the rest of the week. But then the rest of the week, you may want to go out. You, want to make, you may want to do something else. So you waste the food. I waste the food that I overbought. And so then I started going into my own self-analysis, and I'd love you to speak to this. And I thought, well, why did I supposedly feel better overbuying food? Now, I wasn't poor. I, we had plenty of food when I was growing up. Why, do I, why was I so comforted doing that? And, and now that I pulled back, and only bought one entree, it was refreshing. I was empowered, and I said, how ridiculous. Food doesn't do anything to me. I do to me what I need to do to me to feel good. So can you unravel me for a second? Well, I just love that in your description, power, empowerment, the ability to make a decision on your own was so underlying that conversation that being able to order two meals is a moment of power. I have the financial security to afford this while also saying I can restrict and make a smart decision also felt empowering to you. And so I think the goal is if you're over or underspending to understand what is the emotion you're chasing, right? You're chasing feeling power. You're chasing feeling autonomy and having choices. And so what other things can you do in life to have power, control, and autonomy? I think that's the goal is linking the emotion to the behavior. I love that narrative, of course, <laughs> Megan, because, um, you know, in Financial Psychology Center, this is what we work on is, is our tagline is where it's where money and emotion meet. And it's, you know, for us, it's not only understanding the narratives and the beliefs that are driving our behavior, but what is the emotion, the underlying emotion that, uh, that those narratives are bringing up? And I would want to ask you, what did you feel in the moment when you were, I think you mentioned empowered, but is there another emotion, a, a, a deeper emotion than that? that you there felt? was an issue of security. For some reason, I attach security to buying more than I need to eat. And so because of you two, seriously, following, it was only a couple weeks ago, um, following that talk that you gave, I said, let me see how I feel just buying one entree. Because I know buying more than one is a waste of money, and that money could go in a savings vehicle. The security, I felt as secure, if not more, when I curbed my purchase to just what I needed and no more than what I needed in that moment. You empowered me to do that. You, you made me think about this and it felt so refreshing to be able to make a different decision. Now, did I fall back once this week? Yes, I did, but only once. Yeah. And that's what, you know, my, what you did was so beautiful because you didn't say, I am never going to not, like, I'm never going to buy two entrees again. You said, what is it going to feel like this one time? And I wish we did that for all our goals. You know, like I had a massive amount of student loans and I kept on, before I got financial healthy, say, once I pay off my student loans, I'll be happy. And then I broke it down and said, no, once I pay off $5,000, i am going to celebrate that I paid off $5,000. And I get to have all these mini celebrations that even if one month I didn't get a big dent in it, doesn't matter because next month I did it. You did the same thing. You broke it into these bite side multiple opportunities of celebrations. And then when you have a slip up, it's not a big deal because tomorrow you get to celebrate again when you make the right decision rather than, oh, it's over. My goal is over. So you just, we might have started you in the right path, but you set up such a wonderful um, intervention for yourself afterwards. Yeah. And it reminds me of an old proverb, uh, which goes something like, how do you eat a whole cow one bite at a time? Right? So, and, and your story also reminds me of so many of our clients at FBC, uh, when they finally decide to take matters uh, into their own hands as far as their finances, and they're going to be, you know, financial gurus and, you know, take, take the reins back. And what we start to see is it, uh, coming from a place of maybe avoidance, denial, not wanting to look at your finances. 
they go all the way to the other side of that spectrum <laughs> and then they're watching every penny and they're really having a hard time even kind of spending what they're supposed to spend on food on basic necessities and it's actually kind of a common uh, com common theme for our clients common common in that we start to talk about the idea of financial hygiene. And financial hygiene means just like you brush your teeth every day, just like you take care of yourself every day or do things on maybe every couple of days or a weekly basis, you incorporate looking at your finances on a regular basis and develop a certain ritual around that. For some people, it's you know getting a cup of coffee every morning and logging into your um, a financial app, or maybe looking at your Excel spreadsheets every couple of days. Maybe it's as a couple, you guys sit down and do a money date or a Sunday, Sunday meeting as a couple and look at your finances. Maybe it's monthly because it's too contentious uh, for, for you and, and your, your partner. But either way, the idea is that there's regular check-ins on your financial well-being. So let's move into marriage and how money and marriage uh, plays out. So I opened the this episode with divorce is a financial lawsuit. The reason is when we get a marriage license, we have to go to a government building, justice of the peace, the courthouse, somewhere. And it's never been questioned why? Well, the reason why is because the government looks at marriage as a financial contract. And so when we get divorced, it's all about money, except for the co-parenting schedule. If we have children, it's all about money. And people are constantly saying, as we're going through their assets and debts, I'm a mediator and I file for divorce as a paralegal on steroids. Um, why is this all about money? Because they're going through this huge emotional transition in their lives and they have to think about money. And it's very difficult to go through the emotional divorce and then go through the legal slash financial divorce. So when we marry, let's start with that because finan financial issues are the number one reason why people get divorced, not sexual adultery. But when we marry, how does our relationship to money show itself? You know, I think we all come in with all these financial flashpoints that we mentioned at the beginning. And those financial flashpoints lead to these very ingrained money beliefs. And oftentimes we don't even realize that other people see money differently. We don't realize that other people think or value money differently than us. And so mm -hmm. we do a lot of mind reading with our partner where we're like, how do you not see that by you saying, I can't spend money in a purse, you're, you're controlling me or you're taking away my joy or taking away my enjoyment. Meanwhile, your partner might be saying, how could you buy that purse when money is our safety and our security and our future? And so you're talking about two very different things often. And I know I'm rambling a little bit, but this is even more abundantly clear in couples because we often joke about opposites attract, but that's not true. We end up marrying someone very, very much like us in terms of religion and politics and all these other areas, except for when it comes to money. Then secretly, so many of us spenders are attracted to that conservative spendthrift who's so responsible. And so many of those like very conservative, you know, cheaper people are so attracted to the this, this spender who has fun with money. And yet once we get married, we're like, oh my gosh, what are you doing to my wallet? <laughs> so it's one of those very few times that we do come at a situation in such a very different way. I love, I love what you said, uh, Dr. Megan. And actually it reminded me of a couple that I used to work with. Uh, and part of what you know their story was about was money helped to was was a, a source of courtship right we use money to have, court our partners uh, we use money for other money becomes a conduit for many different emotions that happen between the uh, different partners in the marriage and what happened for them was um, one of the partners wanted to feel taken care of. 
And that was an underlying emotion and an underlying belief that she was working off of. And so she wasn't, she wasn't necessarily good with money originally. And when she met her soon to be husband, she reveled in the fact that he was courting her. He was paying for a lot of the, uh, you know, dates and, and taking her out all, all the time. And then as they got married, she also delegated a lot of the financial responsibility to him. And that was one way that she felt, again, taken care of, um, courted, and loved. Did it work out for them? So what happened was <laughs> um, the, the prudence and practicality of the, the husband turned into financial hoarding. Year after year, they chose not to have kids because it was too expensive. Um, she worked as a nurse. Uh, he was well-to-do in the film industry here in Los Angeles. And they lived that way for about 30 plus years. You know, they traveled some. Uh, they had a pretty decent home. I mean, uh, they are dinks, dual income, no kids. And the narrative that the husband used in this particular, particular case was, I just want to have enough money when I retire. I want to be very well off. And then we're going to do everything we're, we, want, we want to do when we retire. Retirement came. And his hold, his control over money and over their overall relationship did not ease up. And in the end, by the time they got on my couch, there was so much emotion, so much resentment, so much feelings of betrayal and grief of, you know, living 30 years with the dream of this, you know, fairy tale uh, of, of a retirement that actually never came. And it was really heartbreaking. Can you say what happened? Um, unfortunately, it was a really difficult conversation. The, the, the wife was really wanting to get services and um, the husband had a lot of pushback, you know, for financial hoarding. It's, it's a really difficult um, diagnosis to work with. Uh, it's a mm -hmm. difficult set of behaviors that... Um, his, his irrational attachment to money was not something that he felt was uh, that needed uh, psychological advice on. Uh, he was perfectly happy doing the things he, he was doing, and he did not see um, any advice needed um, or he didn't need uh, any sort of um, Any, any uh, changes uh, he, did, he did not want to make. And in the end, after about a month or so of going back and forth, he chose to sort of pull the plug on, on the services. So unfortunately, we did not. So you not don't even know if they got divorced or not, do you? No, no, we don't know. Okay, so let's move into something that I could not wait to, to talk about with both of you. But of I wanted to lay the groundwork first because this next concept is so fascinating to me and it goes back to issues over money are the number one reason why people get divorced. You introduced to us the concept of financial infidelity. And let me give an example of how I applied that concept to a, a, a couple that was already divorced in my office but I do get continuing phone calls about how do I deal with I'm not getting spousal and child support. And this is, I think this is a classic example of financial infidelity. So a traditional model of husband works, wife stays home and takes care of two kids. And he made a salary that as a single person in Los Angeles, it was doable. To raise a family of four, it was going to be very difficult. Although he worked, I mean, he didn't not work. But what happened was she, like most wives taking care of children, it's all consuming, 
didn't pay attention to the bank accounts, the credit cards, and where they were in their debt ratio. So when they came in to get divorced, it really was about money. They just couldn't live anymore on what she thought she knew about their debt. But when they filled out all of their disclosure forms, she just about passed out. She had no idea the extent of the debt. And I guess that's an example of financial infidelity. He spent without sharing that with her. Is that what it is? So, there, you know, what's fascinating about financial infidelity is that there's all these different definitions out there. And depending on how you ask what you're doing around the financial therapy, or depending on how you define it, we see tremendously different rates. I firmly believe that financial infidelity is any time we keep a secret from a partner. So this would include things like just rounding down a little bit about how much we spent <laughs> on Amazon or just like not mentioning you went to Target again. Even those minute examples of financial infidelity, even though in isolation they are homeless, I mean, in isolation they are harmless. In the end, what it's a sign of is either you're having shame about your purchases or you're lacking the ability to say, this is what I want to my partner. And both of those things, having money shame and lacking the ability to say what you want to your partner are both signs and indicators of things that you can work on and get better and stronger around. Yeah, I mean, we define it this, you know, very similarly. It's just any time one of the partners is choosing to be secretive around any financial behavior, and you know, this this topic is covered by one of our uh, courses called Love and Money uh, that we have on our uh, website for Financial Psychology Center. And uh, you know, one of the things that Dr. Megan just brought up is, you know, it could be something so minute like, um, you know, hiding the price of something when you went shopping or hiding purchases altogether. And again, it could be just a couple of hundred dollars um, all the way to keeping a secret account or um, hiding financial statements. You know, there, there's a huge uh, span of, of financial fidelity that Dr. Megan just mentioned. And, and I, I would absolutely agree with that. Well, then I will admit to financial infidelity in my marriage, which was a million years ago. Um, he was very conservative with money, almost to a fault, thank you. But, but I was so the opposite. I would rather be him than me, to be honest with you, looking back. But um, as we paid off all of my credit cards, I opened new ones secretly open new ones. Now I always work so I could always pay them. I never, nobody ever paid my bills for me, but it doesn't matter when you're in a marriage, when you're in a partnership, it's all one thing. Maybe you have to have a little bit of your own individual, you know, spending, but it's an agreed upon minimum. You know, I, I think what you're saying is, if you want to have your own little individual way of spending money, don't keep it secret. Just agree you're going to have your own little individual way, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll jump into that and say that for our clients, what we do is um, we develop a contract between the two partners. And part of that contract um, <laughs> includes a spending plan uh, and, a, and a specific number below which each partner does not need to disclose what they spent that money on. And the couple deci decides what that number is. It could be, you know, anything, any purchase below $500, I don't need to dis you know, discuss it with my wife. And so then nobody feels controlled. Nobody uh, gets into a power struggle about, you know, oh, you lied to me or you're being secretive and so on and so on. But, you know, anything above a $500 threshold, you know, you get to decide as a, as a family, as a, as a couple. Do you agree with that, Dr. Megan? Yeah. I mean, I, I wish that it was, I mean, I think that's a safe contract to restart when you're having bad patterns. But with my, uh, with couples, what my goal for them is, is that you guys are fighting for things together so that you say, 
I saved up and then I went shopping to H&M and your husband or your wife or whatever gives you a high five rather than looks at because you guys have a shared goal that you are want these purchases for you and you want these purchases for you and you want these joint goals of these financial future goals that you guys are working together as a team. So you're constantly having individual and couple goals tied together and both celebrating those wins. You mentioned a, a financial goals, and I don't know if this is where you are going to uh, go, Dr. Alex, but we haven't touched upon having financial goals as a couple. It, it, how, how do we begin our relationships when we're married in so far as it affects money? Yeah, I cannot save just to save. There's no joy in putting a dollar into a savings account for me. What I like to do is when I have my financial conversations about my, with my husband, it's not like, let's talk about our bills. Life is so bad. What it is, is what are we working to? What do we want our future us to be doing? What is that going to look like? And those can be small goals. Like I can't wait to get a new wardrobe post COVID and we get to go places or it could be big goals. Like I cannot wait to go to Europe with you. And then money conversations are not work. They are joyful. And saving isn't work. It is saving for this beautiful thing you're looking forward to. And that's why you know, there's no price unless you have a bank that has minimum requirements around savings balances. There should not be a cost to having multiple savings accounts all named after your goals. And then you're not choosing, am I buying two entrees? It's like, no, I'm buying one entree because I'm going to buy an entree in Italy or I'm going to eat my entree in my new Tesla. So like you're putting savings into positive future oriented goals that get to be fun versus constricting. Dr. Megan, thank you for reframing that. It was so beautiful. And what you made me think about was using the positive power of emotions for creating a, a you know a beautiful financial and he- healthy life. And I feel like uh, our emotions sort of get a bad rap <laughs> and especially in the financial world because the narrative oftentimes is, you know, if you want to be smart with your money, you got to divorce yourself, divorce yourself from your emotions and don't get too emotional about money. Right. And I would absolutely agree with that when we we're talking about uh, destructive, negative emotions, shame, guilt, resentment, betrayal in the case of marriage and couples. But emotion is one of the most powerful things we have. In the name of love, we can move mountains. I totally agree with that. And I'm so happy you went there because I wanted to move into the area of financial therapy, how you work with people on that, and that being tied to what you had both talked about in a previous conversation with me, and that was all these different emotions, fear, anxiety, shame, anger, jealousy, et cetera, shame being huge, tied to money, and, and how, how these expressions, how these emotions are expressed through money. Well, I'll, I'll jump in and say that uh, money is a conduit for our beliefs and emotions that our unconscious mind uses to paint our behavior with. Say that once again, please. Money is a conduit for our beliefs and emotions that our unconscious mind uses to paint our behavior with. Give us some examples now. This is great. So <laughs> when, um, when money is expressed through love, and I said this to you before, the common theme is, hey, if you really love me, you would buy me that ring or you would buy me a Tesla or we should get this house because, you know, that's what I want. And if you love me, you would get me this house. Right. That's the expression of love in a couple. And it's just, you know, a similar narrative happens with uh, parents and children. You know, if you love me, you would buy me a, the newest iPhone, <laughs> dad. Or you would take me to Disneyland, dad, mom, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. And so these, all these narratives and emotional currents are aligned with our money. And in therapy, in mental health, we have a term called triangulation. And what happens is money gets triangulated into our relationships, 
Triangulation means that we're not able, I am not able to say something directly to my partner. So I use money to convey that message. I can't say directly, I love you. I'm going to go and buy you whatever that is I think you want. Or it could be negative. I'm going to withhold money from you because I'm resentful at you. I want to control you. Absolutely. And so it becomes a, a, a mode of communication. Passive aggressiveness and all of the things that you talked about, fear, resentment, and so on and so on. Shame. Oh, please. That's what I was going to ask next. Shame. So this, this podcast is coming to you from Los Angeles, the city of money and shame. If you don't have it, you feel horrible. You measure yourself against people who do. And we have these big industries, film and television and real estate, and people become so wealthy. But when you fall from grace, especially in the entertainment industry, you can't change your habits about spending money. A, you can't let people see that you don't have as much as you used to have. And then you spiral into debt to the point of almost being suicidal. Have you seen this happen? I think we can hold on. Think of Sorry, some pop culture references. <laughs> I was just going to say, I think we can think of some pop culture references. I think shame is with money can present in so many different ways. Like you said, with the the idea of the Joneses having more or less than others, it also you know we haven't t- touched at all at all about this, but religion has an interesting relationship with money, and many religious uh, orientations um, kind of have scripture that may lead to money shame. You no know, rooted money is the root of all evil, and so that's underlying a lot of our behaviors around money as well. And so I think shame is such a natural emotion to manifest with money if you don't have a plan if you don't have goals if you are reacting rather than being proactive when it comes to your financial situation well i think we talked about robin williams um because you had an indirect relationship with that family dr alex and a possible reason why suicide came up um yeah so you know uh, my understanding is that uh unfortunately robin williams part of the major narrative of why he took his own life was you know the the aspect that he wasn't financially successful and didn't feel successful overall. Um, Which is shocking, by the way. Yeah. Shocking. And, and, and that's the exactly. I think there's a meme uh, circling around the social media, and it has a you know faces of of uh, famous people who committed suicide, and then the the underlying uh, narrative there for the meme was this is what suicide looks like. And it's all these celebrities smiling and you would never know that they were struggling all up until they, you know, unfortunately took their own life. And that kind of goes back to the deep root of shame, how we never knew that Robin Williams of all people felt not successful. He, he felt like um, financially he, he was not at a place that he thought he wanted to be. And the sort of uh, the the story goes that his son Zach Williams ended up getting into behavioral finance at Columbia University. I don't know. If, I, I've never spoken to Zach myself, so I don't know if it's true. Um, and ended up uh, majoring in behavioral finance, which marries uh, financial planning and personal finance with a little bit of of psychology as well. And he ended up starting a financial literacy program, I think in St. Quentin, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and there's a whole, I think, YouTube uh, video on, on that particular program, which was extremely powerful and informative. This example that I gave of a couple that I worked with, I mean, very lovely people. Whenever I give any examples of people that I work with, they're all, I really enjoy these people. But this topic is so interesting to me and shame because when... When everything came out in the wash, when, when the disclosures were exchanged and um, there was so much more debt, 
And she asked, why didn't you tell me? And he said, well, I thought you knew. And she said, but how would I know? I had no idea these credit cards existed. I had no idea this number of personal loans were taken out. How would I know unless you told me? And I'm not a therapist, but I keep going to, it's got to be shame that drove that silence, that silent behavior. And then where did that shame come from? Uh, Dr. Megan, great that you introduced religion and culture because I was thinking that possibly their religion and their culture um, focus so heavily on being financially successful and being in a select few professions that were recognized by the culture, medicine and law, and maybe finances being those three big things. And he was in none of them but still working at a credible job. It, it, you know, there was nothing wrong with the field he went into. He just wasn't making the money. And I'm thinking he needed to appear as if he was. Speculation, but I, I go back to shame as the root of all silence. Shame is the the biggest the big silencer. Uh, you worded it perfectly, and this is what we do um, in Financial Psychology Center when we work with our clients is addressing the narratives, the beliefs, and the underlying emotions, and helping our individual clients or couples, um, you know, get through those difficult emotions and come out on the other side have the, the difficult conversations between the partners so that, you know, financial health and wellness can be that, you know, can be accomplished in the end. And I think, you know, we talked about before that you know, by the time, you know, your clients see you, um, I termed it as crisis management, right? There are, you know, things are so dire at that point that we're, you guys are working on strategizing how to amicably uh, part ways, whether it's emotionally in the marriage or financially, because it is a business uh, a license uh, contract. But as therapists, we also always you know, look at, try to look at the positive and, and, and empathically look at the situation and look at what could have been done beforehand to address these issues. And maybe to even, you know, be able to save the marriage. And so the idea of, you know, engaging in, in, in financial therapy, um, and we have actually a premarital financial therapy course that we're uh, putting together a financial psychology center, which I'll give a plug to at the end. Um, you know, that's the idea of, you know, we don't want to get to a, a place where the only option is an amicable, <laughs> amicable divorce. We want to start early and, um, you know, be able to help our clients by uh, having these premarital conversations and start early. Well, it, it, divorce is a new beginning. I've said this many times on this program, and it's the last sentence in all of my confirmation emails when I book people to come in for either mediation or to start the filing for divorce. So in the spirit of financial therapy, Maybe this relationship needs to end because the trust is gone in any kind of infidelity. You have an issue of trust. And if the trust isn't there, you don't have a relationship. So to finalize that relationship, the existing one, amicably, it can be with the understanding that each person can be helped in financial therapy in order to have another relationship. Because if you're relationship oriented, you're going to have another relationship. Mm -hmm. And you need to clean up that baggage before you move into another one. Unfortunately, the couple I referenced, my understanding is he's getting married again and well behind on spousal and child support because the money doesn't exist. The brick wall is right there. He's at the brick wall. And so how do you engage in another relationship that's going to be, that you're going to need money for if you haven't addressed the reason why 
your your previous marriage ended. So how do you do that? So, you know, get let's get people to turn around before it's too late for the next relationship. Right. You know, I often get asked, like, who's a good candidate for financial therapy? And my answer is always everyone. <laughs> everyone can benefit from understanding the underlying beliefs around money that make us act unconsciously instead of consciously around money. And so you think about that situation you were talking about, the husband and the wife, and you kind of, I think if you're listening to the story at home, may not vilify, but see one person as a problem child. And in fact, both individuals could do something different with money, right? He could save differently. She could be less avoided and know more about money. And so both partners, everyone can benefit from it. But most specifically, if you saw, see or feel any of those emotions, the shame, the powerlessness, the fear, any kind of negative emotion when you're using money, it's time to resolve those so that you don't have that experience because you can never escape money. We all need to spend it on a daily basis. So make it more enjoyable. <laughs> you said money avoidant. I don't want to leave you without you fleshing that term out. So yes, it, 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 in that traditional situation where he goes to work and she stays home and raises the family and just give me that income tax return, honey, and let me sign it and not look at it. There is a responsibility in, and, and your term money avoidant is wonderful, not even knowing that's what you're doing, but yet you live by this sword too. Yeah, I'm, I'm a reformed money avoidant, so I know this one so good. This is a language uh, Brad Klontz, Ted Klontz, Rick Kaler used to describe individuals that either feel incompetent around money and it makes them anxious. We start like, oh, I just don't know how to deal with money. Or they have that moral, like, money is not important. I don't need to care about money. I want someone else to take care of it. Either way, this avoidance around money uh, handicaps you from being able to, again, be proactive about making plans around money. And so it's just one more way of manifesting um, our early experiences around money and our current behaviors. Well, I was trying to avoid it, this topic, but, <laughs> of course, I'm joking. Um, you know, the one thing that we say to our clients is if we don't know, if we're not aware of what we're dealing with, we can't change it. And if we continue to avoid it, uh, it will continue to be a problem. So, you know, let's talk about, let's start having these conversations. Let, let's get uh, courageous and accountable for uh, our financial lives. And it could, it could be the, the smallest of a step or as big of a step as our client is willing to enable to make. And I think that trajectory is, you know, kind of gets uh, bigger and better over time. So I have found this to be such an inspiring topic. I found both of you to be so helpful to me personally, and I know to the people listening. I, 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 we're just at a time right now where the world is changing so much. And this is an opportunity to really look at everything we need to clean up. And money was at the center of this pandemic. Either our jobs went away and we couldn't even do them at home. So many more people are homeless now as a result of not having the resources, um, either because they didn't save or they just didn't have a job that allowed them to have the resources, or maybe their family is so large that the resources have to become even larger to manage a crisis. But for all of these reasons, I want people to be able to contact both of you now that we're at the end of our, our time. How can they reach both of you and uh, have you help them uh, increase the, the, the beauty of their lives around money? Megan? <laughs> So right now, I'm not seeing clients. What I do is train professionals to become financial therapists. So if you are a practitioner and see your clients having a healthy relationship, whether you're a, a financial professional, a mental health professional, a divorce specialist, you would benefit from having some more insights on financial therapy so that you can help your clients. So I work at K-State, the only financial therapy certificate program um, in the United States. So if you want to take some classes, you can email 
email me and I'll tell you all about the classes. Or if you just want to talk about financial therapy in general, my email is meganmccoy at kstate.edu. Megan McCoy at K State EDU. And that's Kansas State, right? Yes. Okay. And Al and Dr. Alex, how about you? Well, you, you termed it so beautifully. Um, I usually say thank you, coronavirus, for exposing, you know, this mental health slash financial health slash physical health issue right? That's a trifecta of what we had to deal with in the last year. So, we, I tr- you know, we try to look at the, uh, the coronavirus crisis as a, as a positive and definitely sh- uh, has shown a light, shone a light on uh, the financial issues that we've been dealing with in the last year. So, um, thank you so much for, for having us on. Um, if anybody is interested in reaching out to Financial Psychology Center, we're available online. Our website is financialpsychologycenter.com. We're also on uh, the, all major social media, on Twitter at Financial Psychology Center, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And I do want to uh, plug a couple of courses that we have uh, happening at Financial Psychology Center. One of them is the Love and Money course uh, that really delves into retail therapy that we talked about. We talked about uh, financial infidelity, uh, which is also part of that course. Um, and for your listeners, I would love to give them a 50% discount on the Love and Money course with the Love21 uh, promo code. And as I mentioned, also, we are in the process of developing a premarital financial therapy course. Um, and the uh, promo code for that is amicable21. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that. I really love it. Thank you for giving that to, to, to our listeners. That is so very generous of you. And I like the word, I like that you use the word amicable. <laughs> I have enjoyed this more than you know, not only because I have benefited from both of you personally, but every single person listening to this program, I am sure, is taking something away. I want to thank all of you for listening. You know I appreciate every one of you. You can reach me uh, through my email, judith at theamicabledivorceexpert.com, judith at theamicabledivorceexpert.com, or through my website of the same name. Please share this with your friends, subscribe, and I look forward to being with you next week. And as always, have an amicable day. That's our show for today. Thank you for joining us. Be good to yourselves, be kind to your spouse, and cherish your children above all else. 